this is part three of this thing. I've worked on this thing a couple of times before. Did some repairs on it mostly to do with the front panel and switches and indicators and stuff like that. And it does work. It does actually function. And I've shown it on my 18 gigahertz finger counter, which I've repaired previously in another video. Check out other videos, playlists. There'd be a list there for something. I don't know. There's a list. There's a big list. If you're interested in seeing the frequency counter repair or this thing repair, then check those out. But this has got one little thing which has been bugging me since I did the last repairs. When I first did the work on this, a few months ago now, I didn't replace the capacitors. Because oh! they're expensive. They're really expensive. There's four caps, which are big, which I didn't replace. So I've got some replacements, and hopefully they're the right ones. Hopefully they do actually fit. We're from memory from what size the spacing was for the screws for the capacitors because these are screwing capacitors, which is why they're so expensive. I hope they're the right ones, because they weren't cheap. It's about $150 worth of caps. Four caps, $150. Not cheap. Let's get this thing apart, and we'll get into it and replace those, and maybe we'll power it up again and see if it still works. All right, so this is the top side of the unit, and this is the rear left corner. So it's four capacitors in here. These are the ones I need to look at replacing. This one here has already been replaced by someone, a person that got this one, was it? Gavin, I think his name was. I remember now, I think it was Gavin. And he actually gave me a bag of caps. There they are. And I think this one here was the original one that was in it, which had been leaking. Yeah, you can actually see corrosion on that, that post there where it leaked. I had to do some minor repairs to the circuit board there. We had some corrosion on the traces, and I think it actually entered the trace. And I was actually able to get to it and clean it up and solder over it and, and get that working again. Um, although, I'm not sure it was actually completely broken, but I did it anyway. Put in a used capacitor. These caps tested kind of okay, but there was a bit of ripple on the supply line, so that's bugging me slightly too. The fact that old caps, and one of them has already leaked, any one of these could leak at any moment. It's worth replacing them, which is why I'm, it's been bugging me for months. Ever since I worked on this thing, it's been bugging me that I should have replaced these caps, and I should have spent the money, because I want this thing to be in a state where I can go and get this thing anytime, power it up, and it will probably work. Of course, there could be other caps somewhere else than one of these other modules because there's a lot of stuff in here could always be one of those that goes but at least it won't be a main power supply cap which blows and then shoves a whole bunch of AC through the rest of the circuitry and blows up a whole bunch more stuff such as tantalums tantalums do not like AC ripple I'm replacing these to make sure the power supply itself is as good as it can be and then hopefully it doesn't cause any cascade failures later on this little cover here this slides off it's just there to brace the capacitors so it's a nice little detail from HP so the brace you know, capacitors aren't wobbling around off the circuit board from vibration. It helps to brace them all together. I think this is a nice touch. I don't know if I can put that back on again, the new caps. We'll see. We'll see if they're close enough to the right size. So there's the caps in here, and there's this plastic cover under there to protect you from giving yourself a zap when it's powered up if you're working on it. So some of these we can actually get to. We can get to those without having to mess around with it too much. We can get to them quite easily. Six screws that we can get to, and there's two here which you can't get to. Reason being, these are high voltage supplies. So obviously to make sure you can't accidentally touch them. These ones, there's a low voltage. Chance of getting a zap, pretty unlikely. Unless you're standing in a puddle of salt water, maybe. <laughs> but these ones are higher voltage, so I think they're like 70 volts or something potentially across it, so I can't remember now exactly. Well, probably less than that, but because I can't get to those two, I've got to take this panel off. Which isn't actually that bad. It's only got these little plastic clips here, which I'm also worried about breaking when I undo them. So it's got these little nylon plastic screws in there. So you've got to be careful not to break those or overdo it, because they will snap. Nylon does go brittle over time, especially with temperature. They get hot drastically, increase the aging rate, and they get brittle much, much faster. I've had power supplies where they've used nylon screws to secure the transistors to the heatsink, and they've basically just fallen off since I touched them. They just, just literally fell off because they've just gone brittle and they've broken. There's the panel off. Then we can get to these caps. I'll take these out. And interestingly, that felt a bit gunky there when I took that screw out. Foot lock had some gunk on it. This one leaked in that time. Or there's some flux residue I missed. And you've got a little vent just there. And this one looks alright, doesn't like it's leaked. I just felt like there's some gunk on that screw when I took it out. A little bit weird. So I couldn't get exactly the right ready caps of some of these, so I had to substitute a little bit. So that's a 40 volt 10,000. I've got a 40 volt 36,000. And annoyingly, they don't come with any screws. So if you had a different screw type, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? So I've got a 40 volt 13,000 microfarad there. I've got a 40 volt 10,000 microfarad there. I've got a 40 volt 36,000. And I've got a 100 volt 4,700. All Kenet brand. I've got these from DigiKey. The one I want is, for this particular cap, is this one here. 
which is smaller than the, the one that was in it, which is smaller again than the original, which was this kind of size. So it's amazing how they've got a lot smaller over the years. So this is plus or minus 20%, but the one that was in here, which is a substitute, was plus 50% minus, to, minus 10. But that's just a random one I put in. This one that's got to go in there, I've got to make sure I get the polarity right, obviously. There is a vent hole, and you can actually see the vent holes marked on the PCB down here. So there's the capacitor marking there, you can just see the positive on the back of the board, you can see it through the actual uh, PCB, and you can see a hole there as well. See the hole? That's the vent hole. So that vent hole should match up with the vent hole on this. Oh, you get closer. So there's the vent hole there, and this orientation should be that way. So that should be the positive, and it is. So you have to put it in that way up. Don't get it wrong. I'm pretty sure it'll make a quite a big bang if you've got this wrong. So it's that capacitor replaced, that's that one in place now. Now I'll take out the one above it. In this case the positive is on the left hand side. There it is. No signs of leaking. So that's 4200. So this is the one I've got to do a substitute on, right? So I have to go to 100 volts and 4700 microfarads. That's so slightly beefier, slight upgrade. But that's not a bad thing. So positive to the back. Let's try and get the screw in. Hope it's in the right terminal. I can see the vent through the hole. So that means it's definitely lined up. It's definitely correct orientation if I can see the vent through the hole. Not all PCBs have holes for the vents. It's nice this it does have it. But when I've come across these before, there isn't always a hole there. Sometimes you can't see it. You have to just make sure but you definitely get it right. Pay attention to the markings on the cap or whatever and try and make sure you get the right way around. Let's do this one next. This one here, it positive is to the rear again. There it is. Drop the screwdriver on the floor. So that's 8,700 40 volt. Is there a little bit of staining there? A tiny little bit. I think it's started to go. See that? Just next to the vent. Yeah, I think that's starting to leak. That's why I wanted to replace them. So that was 8,740 volt. I've had to replace this with a 10,000. Significant difference in size. So these caps I'm taking out, if I'd had this powered up recently, you'd probably want to discharge them before you touch them. In some cases at least, maybe for the, uh, the 75 volt one, you probably want to discharge that. The other ones are probably all right. But this hasn't been powered up for months. They'll be definitely discharged. There might be any power lifts in these. So I'm not worried about that aspect. But if it's something you're just working on, and it just powered up recently, then yeah, you want to be careful about that because you don't want to accidentally uh, zap yourself by touching terminals which have potentially had a bit of power left in them. Capacitors store power for quite a long time, certainly minutes, hours, sometimes days, months, not so much. So, this is the capacitor I need to replace 20 volt, 30,000 microfarad, and that spacing there looks about 22 millimeters there. If I look at inches, I've got inches on this side, seven eighths of an inch. Okay, so. 7 8 or about 22 mil. Size of this thing. What's the diameter of this thing? About 50 millimeters wide, 2 inches. What's that? 10 and a half centimeters long. 11 if you include the posts. Just under 4 and a half. Yeah. Big boy. So this is the cap I just pulled out, which is that 20 volt, 30,000 microfarad, and I'm going to measure it on the DER since I've got it here on the desk anyway. And see what we get. What does you think of it? For a start, I think this is an inductor. That's not a great start. <laughs> or it's a resistor. Yeah, that's not what I want. Let's change frequencies because it's probably because it's the value of it. There you go. 100 hertz. Makes more sense. Can it read it? So far, it's not looking promising. Let's do manual capacitance. So, that's useless on this size cap. Can't do it. Too big for it. Let's try my other bench meter, see if that will work. So I've got this big chongqing cap, connected up to the east tester, and it can see it, it's fine, 37 millifarad. And this is our 200 hertz, let's change frequency down to 100 hertz. And that's 38 now. So let's chill, so I check the ESR, dissipation is 0.6, that seems a bit high. ESR 0 0.025, no, I'm not sure about that. That might be a bit on the high side for a cap of this size. In fact, the dissipation said 0.6, that's concerning. I think this cap's bad. So this cap, let's have a close look at it. This appears to be a date code. 8140, it sounds like a date code to me. 
based on the year of this unit as well. This unit was built in 1982. So 8140 says one of the later weeks in 1981. Cap is 42 years old, and 42 is a good number. Don't forget your towel. So right now I'm thinking about solutions about how to fit this narrower spacing post cap. Obviously it won't fit any original holes. But if you look at the actual circuit board here, you can see through the board, actually it's quite convenient. You can see the three holes here, which are plated, plated three holes. They've only got a really small surface area of copper on the top side, both of them. All the copper is on the bottom side. So the actual connections are made on the bottom down here, on these two posts. And you can actually see for this top one, the trace comes downwards and then goes around, right? So what I'm actually really tempted to do, it's a bit of a bodge. In fact, it's quite a lot of a bodge. Is to drill a hole in that trace, the correct spacing apart for these posts. And just use the bottom hole as it is, and then basically put a screw through right there in that trace. Now, you can actually see i also got this trace here snaking around, but I think it's still going to be far enough away to be okay. As long as I'm careful, you know, I'll tend to go probably to that side slightly to keep it away from there. But basically where this will be is where the plus symbol is. That's kind of where it will sit. I don't know if I'm going to mirror it on the back board here and see. So there's one hole there. It gives you an idea of how far it's got to move, right? So it's basically where the plus is. Is where it would need to be. The plus is almost like a target. I'm really tempted to do that. I actually think that's an option because the contact's made in the bottom of the ball anyway. All I've got to do is scrape the solder mask off, tin it, and put shove the screw in. I reckon it'll work. It is a bodge though. Right, so I've decided to bodge this a little bit because there is actually room to drill another hole for the circuit board here into the trace, which has the connections, and I can then use this spacing. So that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to drill a hole through and I'm going to make myself a mounting point for it. It's a bit of a bodge, but it's better than spending $100 on one capacitor. That's what I'm going to do, I think. We're going to go ahead and drill a hole through this. I'm sure it'll be fine, what could possibly go wrong? I'm sure nothing would go wrong, eh? Right. One little hole. We have a double check. It looks certainly very close. So this is what I'm talking about here. There's an original mount hole obviously, and I need to move it closer. I'm actually very slightly close here, so I need to move it very slightly over. That's why we start with a smaller drill bit first, because it gives you some room to get the positioning just right, you can double check stuff, and then you can just tweak it as you go to a bigger drill size. Like when I do the next size, I can push it this way slightly and get it lined up better that way. So that's what it will do. So I've got a big pad right here, which means I've got a space to put a screw onto. So that'd be okay. All I'm going to do is got to take this solder mask off here and I'm probably going to tin it. Put some solder on there to tin it so it's got something for the screw to bed into without going straight into the thin copper. Gives it a bit of a surface area. Should make it a bit more robust. I could always do something like put a copper washer on here. I do have some copper washer or even a copper tape. That might be an option, but it may actually be worse because of the adhesive and stuff like that. But I'll put his tin it and that'll probably be good enough. I think it'd be fine. All right, fiberglass brush. I've got to take off the solder mask and then I can tin it. And I'll do it left handed so you can see what I'm doing. How's that? Of course, I could use a knife. That also works. Tough solder mask on this one, it's not really touching it. Small knife it is. Usually, I'll do it. So there you go, there's the hole prepared. I still have to tin it yet because I want to reinforce that original copper because there is obviously no copper on the other side, there's no via there. It's purely that surface copper. So I want to reinforce that a bit with some tinning. So it's got a bit of protection and actually helps us spread across because when you're using something like this, so you've got these washers on, these little star washers, they dig in, right? And which gives you a whole bunch of contact points, which is fine if you've got a large contact area and double-sided and obviously this relies on touching on the equivalent of that on the opposite side of the board and we don't have that now okay there is nothing so before it's coming through this now it's got to come through the screw and touch on this side so I need to reinforce this some more make that more robust and I'm just going to do that by tinning it and that should give it something to bed into and gives it a greater surface area effectively and protects it somewhat so I'm going to do that there so there you go that's all tinned up now ready to go so we can put this thing back together
it should be fine. Right, let's check this thing for ripple now. First power up, I was replacing the caps. Uh, fingers crossed, it doesn't go horribly wrong. <laughs> power is plugged in. Power on. 230 volts coming in. Wait for any bangs when capacitors are exploding. We'll put one in backwards. It happens. <laughs> Alright, let's stick this one here. Oh, I can't stick on this, okay. There we go, through there. The hole's in one place now. So, what we got here 30.1 volts, 0 volts. This is on standby, right? So, it's got ovenized oscillator and stuff like that, which is booting up now. Let's turn it on fully. It's got some loading on it then. So, 11.3 volts and no AC. That's pretty good. Next one. That one before did have some AC on it. So this one's 29 volts and about 0.2 volts AC, 20 millivolts AC. There's a lot of ripple on that one. That line, that line also had ripple on it last time as well when I did the original testing. This one here, same deal. 52 volts, 0.2 volts AC. So there is still a lot of ripple there, but it's definitely no worse than it was the original caps. It's definitely better and 16 volt with 0.3 AC. Now these ripples might get better as these caps, I don't know, age a bit, they settle in a little bit, have a bit of soak time, so I expect they'll get better. And the battery still worked. It's been sitting there for three months and it remembered the last frequency I used. So the battery that I did on this is still working after three months. That's good, nice to know. So let's look at uh, mini volts AC. We'll do some tests with this. We'll check them again. So 175 millivolts on that one. It sounds like a lot, but this is a high current it's a low supply on this thing. Yeah, 380 millivolts on that one. 333. And 407, 406. So those are still quite high ripple amounts though. But for the main supply, it's probably not too bad, really. It does have a lot of current going through this thing. Don't forget, these are before the regulators. This is purely off the diode bridges. So as the diode bridge is coming in with these big bulk cap smoothing caps, which are helping to smooth that diode bridge out, right, to get the DC. And so some ripple is going to be there. Obviously, after the regulators, it would be a lot less. But this is the pre-regulator section. I think that's all right. It's certainly a lot better. So at least I know these caps will be okay for quite a while yet. And like the original ones which could fail at any second. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Reforming. Obviously when your caps you first get them when they're new, they have to reform them because they've been sitting on a shelf for years. I mean these ones I think cover these are date codes of 2021. So they're like three years old sitting on a shelf and they have to build up their oxidization layer or well, oxide layer. So they have to reform and that will mean the capacitance will change and the reactants will change things like that so the ESR will improve that sort of stuff so um, over time it will get better once we've had a bit of use it's completely normal let's try these again see if anything has changed 173 380 still 330 yeah 410 yeah if I turn this off take some loading off you probably find that ripple gets a lot better let's have a look yeah two millivolts see it's relative to loading 152 you go like six <laughs> and two maybe maybe two so massive difference between loaded and unloaded not surprising well there you go it's back together these are the cats we replaced so he's got the oven turned on, turn the power on, that's all good. So the fact it's actually turning on with the frequency I used last time, still on it, means the battery pack upgrade I did last time, well, replacement, that is obviously still working fine because it remembered the settings. So that's a good thing. I don't know if it will actually last without power on. I don't know, it's been a few months and it's been working fine, so it works. Caps are done. So if that's interesting, scrub over there. Patreon support link over there to help me buy things like this to do repairs on and other videos down below and in the description and what have you for playlists of things to look at. I think it's like 1300 videos or something I've done now. There's a lot of work in that. Catch you later.